Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to uh, What's Next. I'm Mark, that's Bill, that's Laura. And, and guys, doesn't it seem like the weeks are now going faster than that countdown? I can't believe it's Friday already. Middle July, I, it's hard to believe. And I'm not sure how far we've gotten with <laughs> with the virus. It, it is amazing. We, we, we are continuing to live in this touchless, social distance, contact, free society and uh it is difficult uh you know it's 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 no fun not being together man at least mark you're at the office i'm still here at the house you know my, my wife is very worried about me in fact she put a lock on the outside of the door for me. <laughs> <laughs> well you know what's been concerning me is i feel the anxiety level on everybody going up people are more anxious they're more stressed they don't know when it's going to end they don't it, there's just so much so I saw this great video, which I shared with you guys, of um, ben, Marie, ben Ramirez in Northern California. And he thought he'd give out coffee to essential workers on their way to work. And he had to figure out how he could lean out his window and still be six feet apart. And look, he uses a gorilla <laughs> arm. I mean, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's functionality and ridiculousness combined to sort of lighten the mood a little. Look at his smile. And the people who pick it up or pick up the coffee, just they love it because he's just lightening that stress a little bit. So I wonder how many people he inspired to do the same thing. Wow. Oh, no, but what are you talking about, Mark? Yeah. You mean other people to have a grip? <laughs> what? I carry one everywhere I go. I bring a gorilla arm because I think if I can lighten somebody's stress just a little bit, and there's so much you can do with it. I mean, of course, we have, I could go to the coffee shop and pick up a coffee. That's easy. But guys, let's get into something a little bit more fun. Like if you finally get to go out to a restaurant, <laughs> hi, here's my American Express card. May I pay now? And people just don't know what to think. I pick up prescriptions at the drugstore. I take the bag off the table of the prescriptions <laughs> using the gorilla arm. And it's always sticking out of the back of my tote bag. It's always there. So I can use it. And, you know, I think we should all come up with a little gimmick to just lighten the anxiety a little bit. So the reaction has been mostly good. Nobody ha has wanted to assault you. <laughs> I have to say, millennials aren't quite sure what to think about me with the gorilla arm. <laughs> it's they're, not the gorilla not... arm, Laura. It's not the gorilla arm. <laughs> <laughs> but but people who are you know a little older than that, they are they get a good laugh out of it. My mom thinks it's hysterical. She wants I take it everywhere I go with my mom. Oh, it's not hysterical. Did you hear the governor of twenty five states have made gorilla arms mandatory <laughs> instead of masks in their areas? It worked. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give that governor a hand. Yeah. It could be coming. Uh, all right. Let's talk about what's coming up because we've got a great interview that I know you guys are going to be moved by and inspired by. We're going to speak live with Mark Miro, a.k.a. Johnny B. Bad. He's the retired WWE superstar wrestler. Look at the belts he's got. He transformed himself into a dynamic speaker with a life-changing anti-bullying, anti-drug message for teens. He's out there on the front lines doing some good work. So we're going to talk to him in just a second. But, you know, first last week, uh, we had the privilege of, of interviewing, you know, Henry Diltz, who is, is one of the most famous, if not the most famous, classic rock photographers. Now in his early 80s, he shot most of the big album covers back in the 60s. Uh, little did we know that we would actually be talking about album covers uh, again today. But this time, it's a very clever idea uh, that came out of a senior living facility in London and a very, very uh, creative activities manager who was trying to find a way to inspire, amuse, and entertain the residents who have now been quarantined for more uh, than four months. So they began recreating classic album covers and then posting them side by side with the original. Uh, it's an effort that has inspired and amused people worldwide, including us. So let's take a look at a, at a few of these and see what they've done. Uh, Adele's 21 is now Vera's 93. I it's love that. That's incredible. I, you know, at first, Mark, I thought these were all going to be like funny, but this is beautiful. That's beautiful art. That's fantastic. Some of them are funny, Bill. Don't uh, don't get ahead of ourselves. Uh, Madonna became uh, Liliana. Well, I got 
Liliana is looking really sexy there. It's gorgeous. She really is. It was cool. Uh, born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen is now born in England, Martin Steinberg. Hey, the only wrinkly thing on Martin's body is the hat. How about that? <laughs> He's looking yeah, pretty I'm kind of thinking if we have Bruce redo it now, what would it look like? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, bad Michael Jackson is now bad Toba <laughs> David. She's got her walker. Uh, she's looking ready to go. Uh, I think we've got a David Bowie, which is one of my favorite. Uh, not really quite sure who uh, who did David Bowie, but they got the makeup right. They certainly did that. Uh, Taylor Swift, TS. 1989 is now RC's 1922. I think that's my favorite. Yeah, they did a great job. And, and finally, uh, the staff got into it themselves with a remake of a, uh, a knockoff of a Queen album. So, yeah, it really was great. And these guys are now getting, you know, acclaim, a request for media interviews all over the world. So good for them. That's a great idea for all of us maybe to do like holiday cards or birthday cards or things like that to create things for our friends. That's an awesome idea. Maybe I think should... I'm going to be creating a Hall & Oates cover. I don't know which one, but Hall & Oates should be. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, I think I'm going to either divulge my age or my ignorance here. You guys will know this. Do people still buy albums or, or are these just... Uh, CD oh, cover. Only record. Jimmy Webb records, from what yeah. I understand. It's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon, but they're the no, only I, album selling. No, if you go to, um, they're collector's items now, so they make collector's versions, and people do actually buy them at concerts. Yeah, very, very cool. All right, let's go on. Uh, you, you know, I hope you guys know this. Uh, you should, because we're all friends and we like to share this. You know, we, we view Growing Boulder as a mission-based company, and, and certainly, we want to do well as a company, but it's more important to us that we also do good. We call it uh, moving forward, yet continuing to give back. And, and today's interview, Bill, is is really a, a perfect example of, of that growing bolder ethos. Yeah, I, I, folks are going to be blown away by by what they're about to see. And, and I, I think it touches all of us because no matter who we are, no matter how successful we get, we all sort of have doubts from time to time about ourselves that if we've made mistakes or some of the choices that we've made, you know, we all have regrets. And sometimes we worry that we're not the people that we should be. Well, you might know the name of our next guest. He was a professional wrestling superstar, really was at the very top. And boy, does he have a powerful story for us. It's not about wrestling, but it's about what's really important in life. Something that he started thinking about when he was a little boy sitting in his room. I remember getting out of my bed and going over that little broken down desk in that little book and writing, I want to get my mom a house. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be somebody. He became somebody in professional wrestling. The kid who grew up with nothing fought his way up to everything. He hung with presidents, got to meet living legends, partied with rock stars, and posed with superstars. Heck, he'd even become a superstar himself as Johnny B. Bad, action figure and all. Johnny B. Bad was such a fun character because it was so opposite of who I am. You know, this, I'm so outrageous, it's contagious. I don't sit down, I get down. So it was this real fun, crazy character, you know. But when you strip all that away and take off all the, the wrestling outfits and all the glamour and, and you just go, hey, this is who I really am. I'm a, I'm a drug addict. I've lived a bad life. I've done some stupid things. I lost the most important people in my life without ever being there for them. And um, this is who I am. I made some really bad mistakes. When his wrestling career ended, Miro felt lost. The man who once filled arenas mostly sat home alone, empty, lonely, searching for a purpose. Maybe, he thought, he could speak at schools, help kids avoid some of his mistakes. So he set up a few presentations, and nobody cared. I try to use statistics and tell kids don't do this or don't, and, and you know, you, and you just, people just sitting on their hands going, when's this guy going to finish, you know? As a last resort, he threw out the statistics and began to speak from the heart, to tell deeply personal stories. He started to make a connection. His longtime friend from wrestling, Diamond Dallas Page, noticed. He sent a video crew to one of Mark's presentations and posted this clip online of one of Miro's most powerful moments, remembering his mother's funeral. Mom, 
You are my hero. Everything I am, everything I hope to be was because of you. You loved me so much. You gave me a life. You're the only one that ever believed in me. How did I repay her? By getting drunk? By getting high? By getting stupid? By hanging out with losers? For what? We are defined by our choices. But if you surround yourself with people involved in drugs and alcohol and pills, it's a dead end. I'm not here to preach to you. I'm here to tell you I lived that life. It leads to broken hearts, broken relationships, broken dreams, and death. For what? To get high? If you have a mother or a father, when you go home, tell them how much you love them. See, my whole life was about being rich and famous. I had to be a millionaire. I had to win the race. I had to win the race to expense my marriage, my family, my friends for what? To be all alone in the world? Love, love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. You, you're the meaning. What a, what a message. What a message for every single one of us, no matter how old we are, Mark. And he's here with us live now, Mark Miro. Boy, when you watch that or when you hear yourself do this presentation, how much, how much do you wish, Mark, that your mom could be here to see what you're doing? Well, Bill, first of all, you got to get me emotional before we even start today. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Bill, I often you know think about that, is that my mom prayed that I would always become the man that I believe I became. And, um, you know, I, I often think that in somehow, some way, she, she knows I'm really doing well in life. And, uh, and I know people that probably have seen my presentation have been doing it now for 13 years. Uh, some people may have passed on and gone to heaven and met my mother and said, boy, your son is doing great. He talks about you all the time. But I was truly blessed to have an amazing mom. You know, I often say that there's the greatest love is God's love for us. But the, right underneath God's love, I believe, is a mother's love. Well, and, and what you're doing, Mark, is so amazing. I mean, it, it, you travel the country going from school to school. I mean, how, how many do you go to? How many can one person do? Well, you know, over the last, we've been doing this 13 years, but over the last seven years, we've been averaging about 230 events a year. So I'm in front of thousands of not only students, but we do churches and corporations. And it's just been, it's an amazing journey. And, you know, by I always find by touching someone's heart, you could change their mind and change their life. And we often get hundreds of letters every day on how this presentation changed or even saved somebody's life. You know, that, that story that, that everybody saw there, that's just less than half of a, a piece that you and I did that's on growingbolder.com. And, and if there's one thing that stands out, it's when you see the, the reaction of those kids in, in those auditoriums. And you can't fake that. And nobody can get through to teenagers, but you, you find a way to get right into their hearts. You must get some unbelievable feedback. I, I do, you know, and the thing is that kids today, it's a, it's such a different world today because of because of social media, or part of, partly because of social media, but I really see the, um, you know, the, uh, the family, the family dynamic is is being destroyed, and and we're we get so involved in 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 our technology, social media. Uh, you know, I went to dinner not too long ago, and I I sat across the table from a family of five, and everyone was either on their phone or had earbuds in, and I'm thinking, wow, don't don't we want to talk to each other instead of talking to someone that we probably wouldn't even even you know don't even have that good of a relationship with, and I often say when. I'm at my deathbed, you know, I don't, I'm not going to care about how many followers I had or, or what someone said about me on social media. I'm going to want to be with my family and people that truly love me. Well, and Mark, it's, it's no, it's not an unusual thing for you to get letters or have kids tell you that they were on the verge of, of doing something irreversible to themselves mm -hmm. and, until they heard your talk, which is amazing. But well, what about you? And you, you, we touched on this in the story. I mean, you really did. You went from filling big arenas, being on national television, having your own action figure to being home, wondering what's next for me? What's my purpose? A lot of us go through that when we retire. How hard was that for you? 
Well, first of all, changes are certain in life. We, we can all agree on that. You know, your your job changes. You know, people change. Your heart changes. Uh, my looks changed. <laughs> but, you know, it's about reinventing yourself. And never in, in my wildest dreams that I think I would be an inspirational speaker, you know. But I found that there's no greater joy than helping another person. And it started off by simply a, a, a school called me and asked me if I'd come and speak to the football team about not doing drugs. And I went and next thing I know, I started getting letters from some of the players saying, man, I really enjoyed your presentation. It changed my life. And then slowly started getting into schools and talking at schools. And then once it took off, one school called another. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, 230, 250 events all over the country, all over the world. We even went to Russia and spoke at schools in what Russia last year we were in Guatemala and it just continues to just 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 expand up until March 12th of this year where everything changed bill we all know about this pandemic that we're all going through and so you go from doing that many presentations to waking up and all the schools are canceling all the churches are canceling the corporations are canceling and then you have nothing and you wonder, what am I going to do? And I know many that are listening to this are going through the same thing, like their job ended or, or, or relationship ended or something happened in their life that life just took a drastic turn. And I start thinking, what, what can I do? I still want to help people. I still want to make a difference. And that's where we start doing these virtual presentations or doing shows like Growing Boulder and, or being on as many podcasts and different things that we can do to keep inspiring people and keep giving people hope. And, um, and then it just, uh, that started taking off. I mean, there's nothing like a live audience, don't get me wrong. And especially at the end when I get to meet students or people and give them a big hug or a high five or, or hear their story, that is the real joy I get out of uh, not only seeing the, the difference that the presentation is making, but getting to talk to people and meet people and then having friends for life. Yeah, Mark and Laura are here as well, and very impressed, Mark, with with your abil your ability to truly inspire people. Right, guys? Oh, I, I had to. It took me a, a few minutes to come down from that presentation. That was so emotional what you did. But Mark, you touched on something about how everybody's home now, and we are alone after having all this activity. And what I'm hearing a lot is that. People with addiction issues are having so much trouble now. Uh, it's uh, They don't have the groups to go to. What are your thoughts? How can your words inspire them to stick to their, to stick to their habit of, of being sober? Well, first of all, the one thing I, I share with people is please don't hold things inside. I mean, we have this amazing ability. I mean, we could use social media in such a positive way too. Um, but when you hold things inside, it's Man, it's like a volcano. And sooner or later, that volcano erupts. And it mostly erupts in, in, in negative behavior. It could lead to, lead to depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal thoughts. And that's why it's so important to talk to each other. Let's not talk about each other. Let's talk to each other and encourage each other and help each other and share your story. Your story could probably help or maybe even save another life. So it's a good idea to continue going to those online meetings. Oh, absolutely. I encourage it. I, I encourage you to reach out to to people that you can um, have private conversations with. I, I do so many every single day. I'm on I'm on my computer quite a bit, and especially now having more free time, I'm I'm answering many letters and emails and, and um, comments from people that are, are needing help or just, just want someone to hear what they're going through or what they're thinking. And I know that we've really um, avoid, avoided people from hurting themselves or taking their life. You know, folks, if you're just joining us, we're talking with Mark Miro, a former uh, WWE superstar wrestler who has totally transformed himself. Uh, you know, Mark, thank you so much for, for doing what you do. And isn't it interesting that, you know, when you shared facts and figures and statistics, it, it pretty much fell flat. But when you when you shared yourself, I mean, the good and the bad and the ugly, and, and, and Lord knows you've had it all, uh, the message started to resonate. Is there a Mark Miro takeaway. Uh, you know, I, 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 I get your life is probably not perfect now. Nobody's is. You're going to have challenges ahead. But as you move forward, you know, what can we take from your story that can help us? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't realize, I, um, especially when you're in counseling or you're helping somebody else. I mean, my, my, um, gosh, my therapy is actually being on that. Those live performances was my therapy. And, um, but people don't realize that I also have to take on a lot of pain because you're hearing a lot of 
it, it, it's depressing stories. It's things that people are going through, people thinking about killing themselves. And you take on a lot of pain because you're praying about it. You're hoping that they're not going to hurt themselves or you're hoping that your words resonated with them. But, you know, this was one of the toughest years that I've ever experienced. Not only um, I, I, I lost uh, six very close friends and family members this year, and it was devastating. And, and I, I, you know, I was on stage sharing my story. And, and the thing I didn't realize that they're probably the best presentations that I've ever done only because I was coming from a place of pain. In other words, I... I, I didn't want anyone to have to go through what I felt or, or what I was going through. And, and, I, and I understand or resonate with kids that are being bullied or abused or the loss of a loved one or parent that lost a child to drug overdose or suicide. And that's what I, I, I deal with on a daily basis. But because I, I want to help them so badly, I don't want them to have to go through what I went through. And I encourage them to share their story because it's so important that we we can talk to other people that are going through something or or thinking worst case scenarios. Hmm. And you know, congratulations to the schools that do invite Mark because it's uh, you can imagine how it's something that these students will never forget. Life lessons, the conversations that we all need to be having, and we can all find ways to take our life experiences and use them to make a difference in the lives of others. Mark, I think we're gonna wrap here. We, we, you know, everything, congratulations and thank you for what you're doing. I mean, you're making a difference to not just kids, but you know, people my age as we kind of look at what's next in our own lives. So Mark, thank you so much for what you do. And I'm sure we'll see you on Growing Boulder very soon. Thank you so much. I just want to say to anyone out there that you're, if you're going through a trial or tribulation, it's going to be your future testimony. Just don't ever give up. The best chapters are about to be written. Wow. Isn't he great, guys? Amen. You know, it, it's it's amazing. And, and I love the part where he said, I never imagined I'd be a motivational speaker. Yeah. And if you go all the way back to that first request, will you come speak to a school having never done it, you know, a different kind of venue, a different kind of audience he had, uh, he was bold. He said yes, not knowing how it was going to end. And, I, and, you know, there's so many takeaways, but for me, that's one of them. We have to say yes when we're presented with opportunities. That's it. And I, I also really appreciate his incredible honesty. He mm -hmm. will share anything. Uh, and I think that's what lets people relate to him. He's so real. I, I, he's a wonderful interview for this show. Thanks for bringing him on, Bill. And, and, and you know, he wasn't a success when he started. That's the other thing we forget. I mean, it looks easy now, makes sense. But when he started, it didn't work, but he kept mm -hmm. at it. And here's the best part. He played a hero. That was his job to pretend to be a hero as a wrestler. And now he's become a real life hero mm -hmm. to kids everywhere who were looking for relevance, looking for someone to say, yeah, you matter and you're okay. Mark mm -hmm. Miro, very, very cool person. Unbelievable. You know, we always say that, you know, we're building Growing Boulder by telling the stories of ordinary people that are living extraordinary lives. We don't really pursue celebrities for the sake of their celebrity. But, you know, I, I think we've come to realize that, that maybe the highest value of many celebrities is when they do what Mark Miro just did. And that is remove the veneer mm -hmm. and, and share the reality so we can learn from their lesson. And, and, and Laura, we saw that a couple of weeks ago with uh, uh, the Kim Campbell interview interview that you did and what she shared about Glenn Campbell and his addiction to drugs and his struggles with violence and everything else. It's, it's, it's just amazing and, and helpful to all of us, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. When you're that honest, it lets other people see that nobody's perfect and, and we don't have to be perfect. We just should try to be happy. And Mark, you're right. The, the reason that it works, it's so powerful from celebrities is because we think they've got it made. They don't right. have a care in the world. You know, they've got they've got people that adore them. They've made big money. But boy, life is tough for everybody. Ups and downs. And it's such a strong and inspirational message that Mark Miro has to share. Very proud to have him on the program. It, it helps if you have a community. It helps if you have friends. You know, Bill, it helps if you have a tribe. Boy, Mark, I don't. I wish there was something we had next to relate to that. Hey, guess what we do? Uh, a segment called Finding Your Tribe that we bring you almost every week here. And figuring out what's next in our lives is never easy. But boy, it sure helps when we're surrounded by a group of people that helps inspire us to do what's best. And in today's Finding Your Tribe segment, we're going to meet a woman who found her tribe in a very interesting club called Twisted Sisters.
Sometimes finding your tribe means finding people just like you, but not always. Our next guest found her tribe by finding people who were very different culturally, ethnically, and racially through inclusion, through diversity. It really is an interesting story. So let's say hi to our guest, Suzanne Huttenstein. How are you, Suzanne? Hi, Bill. So nice to see you. Tell us about this group and tell us about what it is that drew you into it. Um, first of all, I think the group, um, the diversity in the group, we were all so different, but how we blended together to form this sisterhood to me was amazing. We have different political views. We have different religions, uh, different ideas on life. Some have no children. Some have a lot of children, grandchildren. It, it was just amazing to me that we could bring 24 to 30 girls together and have this um, group that was so cohesive and so interested in each other and learning about each other. What was it that uh, kept it from being just, well, it's kind of interesting to being something that little by little, you really kind of uh, sunk a lot of yourself into? The key thing was helping each other. Um, some have spouses that are ill, some have uh, spouses that might be on hospice, um, birthdays, things like that. We just came together to make each person feel special. You know, finding your tribe sounds so simple. You know, it's a concept we all agree that we need, making new friends, stepping out of our comfort zone, doing different things. But it really can be so hard to do. Is it worth it? And what would you say to people who are going, well, I don't know, I'm kind of comfortable doing what I'm doing? Well, Finding your tribe and meeting new people is always difficult. But I think if you you just kind of know when you click, I mean, we've all met people in our life that say, hey, I think we'll be friends for the rest of our lives. And that's how these girls ended up coming together. We just had this bond. It was scary because having different political views or religions and things, you're not sure how other people will accept you. And this group, there's no holds barred. We accept each other as we are. Great, great story from Suzanne Huttenstein. A life lesson, too, because you think that when you retire, you, you move from one end of the country to another, that maybe this is wind down time. But here's a great example that her life has changed for the positive in ways that she never, ever expected. Suzanne Huttenstein found her tribe through inclusion and diversity. Where will you find yours? You know, I think her story really ties into what Mark was just saying, is that you need to have people around you. You need to have people who support you, are kind to you, and lift you up. Uh, it was really lovely. And, and having girlfriends or a guy having guy friends is really essential in life. You need someone outside that family circle. That, that was a wonderful story. And, and kudos to the Twisted Sisters for, you know, being able to have a group uh, where they not only listen to, but respect others' opinions, because I think, as we all know, that's been really, really hard for so many people this past year. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just have to be hobbies and athletics. I mean, you can find your tribe in the differences uh, that we have in our own communities. Yeah, amen. Thank you for bringing that to us. So let, let's begin to put this into the garage if we can. And, and let's start with our, our meme for the morning, uh, a reminder that life is not necessarily about winning the race. I think that's something that Mark Miro said just a moment ago. It's about enjoying the ride and enjoying it with others who share your passion, who are in your tribe, uh, is critically important to our overall health and our happiness and our longevity, which is pretty much uh, what's on my mind this morning. You know, I want to talk very briefly about the difference between uh, life expectancy and lifespan because they are two very different things. Life expectancy uh, is a statistical average. It's the age to which most of us can expect to live. Uh, it accounts for uh, infant mortality and, and those who live very, very old. And of course, back in the, the dark ages, uh, life expectancy was, was very short because there were plagues and there were pandemics, uh, there were infections, there were no primary care physicians, and of course nobody had a, a membership to a, uh, a gym or a health spa to do that. Um, 
life expectancy has increased dramatically over the past 200 years, but not because of a change in in genetics, not because of a change in the aging process. It has risen primarily uh, because of improved health care, because of better lifestyle choices. We are simply getting better mileage out of our vehicle. We're not changing vehicles. Uh, lifespan, on the other hand, is defined as the oldest individual uh, that has ever lived uh, in a species. And for human beings, that's 122 years, 164 days. That's how how long Madame Jean Calme lived before she died in France in, in 1987. And, and she lived that long primarily because of the lifestyle choices that she made. Uh, yes, she certainly had to have had some good genes, but she, she took up fencing for the first time when she was 88. She rode her bike every day until she was over 100. She lived alone uh, until she was 110. She had uh, the joie de vie, uh, the joy for life. And, you know, that's what got her to 122 years and 164 days. I have to tell you, no other human being in history has lived a verified life up to 120 years. So lifespan is about it. It's what we can all reasonably hope to live to. So the question becomes, how do we improve our health span? How do we improve the quality of our life? There are many companies these days because they see some sort of financial incentive that are trying to cure aging. They look at aging as a disease and they think they can make a lot of money if they can figure out how to help us live longer. And the only way to do that theoretically is through genetic intervention. Uh, but I have to tell you this, even if they do figure out a way to help us to live longer, it will not help us live better without our participation. Uh, the only way we can improve the quality of our life is to improve the lifestyle choices that we make. And, and I don't know about you guys, but I do not uh, fancy the idea of living to 122 and having no quality of life. On the other hand, if I can be Madame Jean Calme and be riding my bike and eating two pounds of chocolate and having a, a, a little shot of brandy every day like she did, then, you know, sign me up. Uh, so again, it, it's not about winning the race, it's about enjoying the ride. And uh, so I bring us back to, to, to the meme that we started this little wrap up with. Uh, enjoy the ride, folks. Aspire for more. Uh, want to do better. But remember that this moment is all we have. So figure out a way to enjoy the ride. And Bill and Laura, I got to tell you, I'm enjoying the ride with you guys. Mm. That's well, awesome. Three things. Live with purpose. Live with pride and use a gorilla arm. I was just going to say that. Make sure you laugh. <laughs> there you go. Amen. Way to tie it all together, guys. Uh, <laughs> that was perfect. Hey, next week, um, if, if, if it doesn't fall apart, we've got a, we, we've got, and it always could, you know, let's be honest, things could fall apart at this moment, but Laura, we got a pretty interesting interview coming up next week on this show, right? We do, but I didn't tell her yet. So, <laughs> all right. So we'll just tell you. You're gonna dig it. You're you're gonna like it. Uh, uh, tune in next week, ten o'clock. Okay, we're gonna just go down. We are gonna party. It'll be tough to top Mark Miro. That was awesome. Yeah, oh, that was great. Amen. Uh, great. Thank thank you for that. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. A great week. And uh, before you know it, it'll be time for what's next. Again, see ya. Growing.